Hello, this is Astrology Hotline. I'm Kyle Pierce, and this is the forecast for January 30th through February 5th, 2023. We're going to be going over the main transits for the week ahead, going a little in-depth on what I would consider to be the, the main astrological events for the week that are going to sort of color things. And we'll finish off by sort of day by day of the week using the planetary days as our guide. The uh, main events for this week are uh, the full moon in Aquarius, January, uh, February 5th, which will be taking place at uh, about 16 degrees of Aquarius and 16 degrees of Leo, respectively, where the sun will be at about 16 degrees of Aquarius and the moon at about 16 degrees of Leo. And both luminaries will be rather tightly square Uranus and Taurus at about 15 degrees. The sun further will be in the process of purifying uh, Saturn, <laughs> um, or at least trying to, perhaps getting dressed down by Saturn, maybe more accurately. Uh, but Saturn will be at about 26 degrees of Aquarius, so firmly uh, uh, no longer visible to the naked eye be firmly under the beams of the sun, which is uh, definitely going to color the sun, <laughs> what the sun's doing during this lunation. And because the sun rules the moon in Leo, uh, it's going to obviously affect what's going on with the moon. So uh, interesting lunation. We're going to talk about that a bit more in depth. And then just prior, uh, well, we're going to have Venus in Pisces applying to an exact square with Mars in Gemini. And that should go exact uh, late Saturday night, uh, around 10 or 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. But obviously that will vary depending on where you are in the world. But we'll definitely be building up uh, throughout the week. And we'll likely color our experience of both Mars in Gemini and Venus in Pisces uh, even as it's separating over the next week or so, week or, or two. So before we dive into that, I uh, just want to take a quick moment to humbly request that if you are a fan of the podcast, uh, want to help us out, you know, uh, go ahead and give us uh, all five of your stars on Spotify or on Apple Podcasts, whatever podcast app of choice uh, you happen to use. And if you are watching on YouTube, uh, give us a like, go ahead and subscribe, share on social media. All those things are super helpful for growing the podcast. So deeply appreciated. And then if you are interested in learning about the 36 seconds of the Zodiac, go ahead and take a look at the show notes and join us on the Three of Wands Discord server, where we have a... Uh, about three times a month, uh, every Tuesday at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, or I should say three Tuesdays a month, <laughs> uh, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, where we will talk uh, about the meaning and significations of whichever Deccan the sun is at, if you're unfamiliar with the Deccans. Uh, the Deccans are basically a division of the zodiac into 36, dividing each sign of the 12 signs uh, equally. By three. So, uh, and a nice, neat little 10 degree slices. And each Deccan has uh, thousands of years of images sort of associated with them, which really uh, paint a picture of specific uh, kind of characteristics of each of these little slices and helps you interpret and understand uh, what's happening to any particular planet that's in one of these these decans to really expand on the meaning of the signs as well. So highly recommended you join us. We'd love to have you. And with that, let's jump in to the astrology of this week. And we're going to talk about uh, Venus and Pisces square, Mars and Gemini first. So if you tuned in last week, you might recall me uh, extolling the virtues of uh, Venus and Pisces here. And we'll be starting the week off with Venus about three degrees of Pisces, while Mars 
is over here at about nine degrees of Gemini. Putting them at about, uh, within about six degrees of a square, which is certainly well within range to be relevant. Uh, and unfortunately, this aspect is going to color most of our time with Venus and Pisces, uh, at least until the later portion of the month. It'll kind of leave orb with Mars. Mm, I usually like to get within the 10 degree range uh, before I would be comfortable mm, electing anything using Venus, but by then we're going we're gonna to have uh, Venus exactly conjunct Neptune, which is good for some things, uh, but uh, certainly narrows or you could also say overly widens the uh, applicability uh, of Venus, uh, but we'll sure talk more about that <clears throat> when the time comes. Uh, nonetheless, we're not getting... Uh, a quite archetypally pure version of Venus and Pisces. Nor will we for quite some time, because <laughs> uh, for the next uh, two or three years, we're going to have Saturn and Pisces, which will, uh, you know, tamp down the, you know, joy that Venus and Pisces uh, might have on offer. Uh, certainly, certainly we can say that uh, we're not going to have um, an election-worthy and certainly not talisman-worthy uh, Venus in her exaltation uh, for several years to come, unfortunately. But, uh, you know, why wouldn't we want to play with Venus in Pisces square Gemini? Uh, or we might play with Venus in Pisces square Gemini, but it's a, you know, uh, more challenging kind of relationship for Venus and Mars to have, uh, the square being the nature of Mars uh, traditionally. It is one of contention, typically, while certainly uh, within a given birth chart for a person, you know, there's a lot, uh, you have a lifetime to negotiate squares, and in many cases, you know, we find ways uh, with working with them uh, to work with them, maybe reconcile those to varying degrees, but, you know, if we're trying to get things to, get things off to a smooth start from the get-go, you know, we usually don't want to uh, initiate things when we have uh, challenges to the uh, the said sphere of that thing. So, you know, Venusian things. Uh, if you have really big, important projects that you want to start, or if you want to, you know, release uh, a piece of art into the world, or, you know, start a new relationship, eh, <laughs> it, could, it could be a little dicey. It's not to say, like, don't do any of those things is just be aware that uh, there'll be some martial challenges involved, which means uh, conflicts um, or a uh, increased potential for disruption or severance or um, an abrupt ending to a relationship. As Mars signifies uh, severing, cutting, division, uh, while Venus signifies harmony, union, pleasure. Mars is uh, stabby pain loud sounds. Venus is nice, pleasant, harmonious sounds. Uh, they're very much opposite sides of a, a spectrum, uh, but in many ways sort of a, a pair. In uh, Greek mythology, uh, Venus or uh, Aphrodite and Mars had a, a very spicy kind of relationship. In fact, they were supposed to be married. However, uh, the god uh, his Hephaestus intervened sort of creatively. Um, long story short, the uh, Aphrodite ended up marrying a different god, and Mars wasn't too happy about that, and Venus wasn't particularly happy about that either. However, they did carry on their relationship uh, in secret. Neither a a Aphrodite or Ares were particularly um, faithful to their spouses, <laughs> and often when we get Venus-Mars combinations, um, we get things of that nature sometimes. We get things like infidelity uh, and sometimes uh, some of the problems that come with being a little too lustful uh, or sometimes um, a drawing in or being drawn to problematic relationships because uh, <clears throat> in many ways Venus-Mars combinations 
in pretty much all aspects, hard or soft, will tend to draw in relationships uh, of, of, of different kinds, um, some more favorable than others. Because when you combine, say, the uh, harmonizing, glamorizing, attracting qualities of Venus and the directed, invigorating, and um, heating quality and Mars, um, it's metal uh, <laughs> that Mars is deeply associated with is iron. See, you literally combine iron and attraction and you get magnetism. So most Venus-Mars combinations will grant uh, people born under them uh, a certain kind of magnetism, uh, an ability to attract or establish um, relationships or draw people to them. Again, not always um, for the good. <laughs> uh, sometimes it, it can very much signify uh, an over, a tendency to overindulge or a sort of overheating of the libido. So often it will signify uh, many um, short-term relationships, relationships that don't tend to stick together too long. However, sometimes the uh, friction that Mars introduces can help keep uh, a longer standing relationship spicy, you know, keep it interesting. Often depend on the aspect as well as, you know, how the person works with it. But in this case, uh, with Venus and Pisces, in a square relationship with Mars and Gemini, uh, this one is a little more problematic. And there are several ways I see them altering each other. One, I, I guess the first thing I think of is that uh, Venus in Pisces is, you know, Jupiter ruled. So it's a bit more conscientious. It's a bit more, I'll say, considerate and moderate in how it goes about achieving or attracting pleasurable activities or persons into their sphere. And in this sort of tense relationship with Mars, I see Venus's tastes getting a little more immoderate and possibly becoming a little more shallow. You know, Venus in Pisces is deep and oceanic, right? And Venus in Pisces is good at sort of bringing out and emphasizing those pleasures and those beauties <laughs> that I exist on a, a deeper level, sort of enhancing and, and bringing them up to the surface a little bit more. It tends to be soft and subtle and just right. You add Mars in the equation and there is sharpness and heat. That <laughs> There's a sort of whipping up of the water, maybe turning it into a bit more of a whirlpool or sort of a roiling cauldron <laughs> of water as opposed to a, a serene and ever-flowing ocean you know it's uh more turbulent venus perhaps doesn't get a chance to really get beyond the surface level in some ways especially with mars sort of introducing uh in gemini lots and lots of different possibilities <laughs> that multiplying and bifurcating that mars and gemini is going to do i see sort of scattering venus a bit <laughs> more is <laughs> Uh, Venus and Pisces on her own is quite good at finding that sweet spot where, you know, we are connected in our relations with others, uh, but not overly attached to the point where we can't let go. Uh, with Mars introduced into the equation, I see that sort of tipping the balance over towards uh, Venus maybe being a little less attached. Uh, maybe very non-attached in some cases. Potentially drawing out figures uh, from the woodwork that are perhaps quite capable of weaving a sort of glamour, sort of en uh, enchanting uh, and seductive quality, and who perhaps might even be able to sell you on uh, something a little more eternal <laughs> uh, and transcendental with uh, perhaps little intention of of permanence <laughs> if you will uh it's you know a kind of a player energy that i sort of get mars i think turns venus into a bit more of a heartbreaker than she would otherwise be you know it might be good for a, a one-off kind of uh fling experience but one that is maybe so uh it could haunt your dreams later on you know <laughs> it's uh 
say we may see some beautiful birds appear, but perhaps not the kind that are likely to stick around too long or uh, be willing to be caged. I think also that uh, Mars could make Venus's pursuit of pleasure uh, a little more goal-oriented than would really, you know, be optimal for genuine pleasurable, uh, for genuine pleasure or mutually um, beneficial pleasure. Often when we're in a rush to get to the the end uh, to achieve the outcome, we don't really stop and uh, enjoy uh, the smell of the roses or, you know, the the touch and sensation. Uh, we, we don't caress the roses uh, appropriately and uh, an otherwise uh, enjoyable uh, moment or activity uh, could be brought to completion um, perhaps sooner than, <laughs> than, um, than some of us would like. You know, uh, Mars is desirous uh, and as, as is Venus, but this particular combination could be a little bit too, <clears throat> uh, too hot in the pursuit too quick on the draw, if you will, to to go after uh, something desired and, and could lead us into trouble or controversy and just, you know, not deliver the kind of experience that we're trying to achieve with Venus and Pisces, right? You know, we don't get to uh, rise with the, the cresting, uh, rise and fall with the cresting and ebbing waves of pleasure that uh, Venus and Pisces delivers. Uh, we're maybe on our surfboard and trying to make things happen um, without respect to the, the natural flow. Now, on the positive side, Venus uh, is in a, the superior side of this aspect. Pisces uh, being an earlier sign um, than Gemini, she would be said to uh, be on the 10th from Mars. One way to uh, imagine it is, is if you had Gemini uh, rising, you'd have Mars in the first house, with Venus and Pisces in the the tenth house, uh, kind of like so. So Venus is on top uh, in sort of commanding position. So in many ways, this it can be kind of positive, uh, at least in terms of sort of softening uh, Mars. Venus can use her her moisture to um, sort of cool Mars off and potentially, you know, demand that Mars. Uh, do her bidding in a, in a sense. This is uh, kind of considered a bonification uh, of Mars to some degree. While, uh, you know, probably prefer it in the context of a trine or sextile, perhaps, uh, just because you're always going to get a certain amount of back and forth between planets and aspect. Uh, it's, it's less problematic than maybe the other way around. But that interaction with Mars is still going to, to alter Venus. You know, she can't really avoid the engagement with Mars. So I, I rather like it more from uh, Mars's perspective in, in a lot of ways, you know. Uh, if you were going to try to use Mars for something, um, Venus will sort of help uh, ensure that things will run when, within a certain parameter of <laughs> maybe not so abrasive or um, violent, hopefully. <laughs> um, as Mars can be in, in some cases, will sort of force um, Mar Mars's activities to, you know, it's less uh, Mars uh, kicking your door down and taking what he wants and sort of leaving and, and maybe burning the house down. Uh, it's Venus sort of saying, no, you know, fine, I guess Mars, you're going to do your thing, but like uh, pay them, <laughs> uh, you know, take what you must, but like soften the experience at least make it somewhat equitable and fair. Or it may uh, sort of imbue Mars with the ability to get uh, what he wants through charm rather than brute force, which while uh, can be destructive in its own, that can be destructive in its own way, um, in most contexts, I would rather be pickpocketed than having my ass beat <laughs> and robbed, you know. So I would say uh, Mars is probably getting the better deal uh, out of the equation or at least from an experiential level if you're trying to do something martial just not necessarily robbing someone uh if you're you know uh going expecting a situation where you might be in a debate of some kind um or need to make an argument 
or make a uh, impassioned case for something or you know defend yourself uh particularly in a, a non-physical way uh mars in an air sign it's a little better for uh mental kind of martial stuff <laughs> venus can lend a, a certain amount of charm and charisma and perhaps an ability to acquire victory without having to hurt too many feelings but also uh to some degree venus being uh cooler and a little more languid and you know chill uh could make mars a little lazier a little less vigorous uh which often we want uh, it's, it's kind of mars's problem sometimes is, is a little too vigorous but uh, depending on what you're doing venus could make mars a little softer than you would like but you know i would just be a little watchful uh if you are to enter into any close uh romantic partnerships over the next couple weeks well, i don't think it would be universally the case for everybody who um, starts a relationship during this time for it to be uh inherently problematic there is likely to at least be a period of needing to work out kinks if things go beyond a certain point you know this sort of looks like uh really the nature of the square sort of um being at like a coffee shop and like running into an attractive person maybe and like just spilling coffee all over them uh and that encounter maybe sort of sweeping you off your feet you know but i would uh, resist expecting too much from an encounter like that otherwise i uh, might be setting yourself up to have some unnecessarily hurt feelings perhaps um but also if you're the kind of person that enjoys a short-term sort of fling uh which you know, there's nothing inherently wrong with that as long as the other person is uh, on the same page, you know. I would maybe suggest being upfront about your intentions because it's possible that the, the other person might be expecting more than, than maybe you're prepared to offer. So some things to keep in mind. But with that, let's, um, let's move on to, to the full moon in Leo. But I want to focus a little more on... Uh, the sun's co-presence with Saturn, as well as uh, the square that Uranus is making with both luminaries. So with this full moon uh, at its core, it's really bringing into fruition uh, a lot of what we talked about a couple weeks ago with the new moon in Aquarius and a lot of these themes around figuring out what uh, needs to be let go of, what needs to be left behind in order to step into uh, a more individ bleh, individuated and authentic sort of life space. There's a sort of tension around wanting to set out on the frontier and uh, kind of carve out a world for yourself, but being sort of held back by obligations or um, expectations that have to do with sort of way of being or uh, life or period of one's life that is no longer... It's maybe become stagnant or maybe it no longer feels appropriate or just feels stifling, you know, <clears throat> constraining. So there's a sort of potential sort of paying off of uh, debt in, in a sense, possibly literally, but, you know, fulfilling uh, one's obligations in order to be released from, from them. So with the full moon here, that process that was initiated a couple weeks ago is now being brought to to culmination or a phase in that process at least and what we're really having emphasized is these sort of three very different approaches to individuation we have uh the moon in leo about 16 degrees which naturally signifies uh, a sort of obvious and natural sort of individuation this decan has to do with uh that sort of individual attention that comes from kind of being uh, on a stage in, in a sense, like being singled out and standing in front of others in a way that uh, everybody has their attention on. You're performing. Uh, and there's a natural expectation that everybody is going to look at you because that's your role in Leo. You're, you know, you are the lion, the king of the jungle. You know, hear me roar, right? Uh, it's very, it's a very sort of natural, uh, <laughs> in many ways, idea of like what we, we think of. Uh, when we are fully individuated, owning our ourselves, standing apart from others, uh, but 
more at the center, the center of attention, center of focus, a part, but in a sense, the, the center of gravity that others revolve around. While the sun, uh, the natural ruler of Leo, right, is all about that. It's all about being the center of a universe, if you will, or a solar system, standing uh, in the center and letting what, letting those products <laughs> that uh, emanate from within um, expand outward and be reflected back, being a, being a self, right? However, uh, Aquarius is uh, the opposite sign from its home, Leo, putting it in a place of uh, sort of exile. It's, it's, not, it's not at home. It's actually quite far from home. You can see home quite clearly, <laughs> uh, but it is not, it's not there, but it's still the sun. So it's still doing the sun thing, the, so, the solar thing, the being a point of consciousness and emanating uh, awareness outward. However, in Aquarius, that point of consciousness goes from the center to the periphery, where it's looking at things uh, from the outside, even observing oneself from the outside. While uh, Leo's very subjective in terms of being a uh, you know, subjective um, point of consciousness, I am me, I am who I am, uh, Aquarius is much more objective and observational in, in the sense that the uh, self and identity is going to form very much around uh, self in relation to everything else and focusing more on the difference between the self and everything else. Sort of uh, observing the world and observing the self like an anthropologist would in a sort of detached, kind of cool way, but this sort of objectifying way too. Saturn, uh, the ruler of Aquarius, traditionally, uh, is not about um, validating your needs or validating your uh, individual, your, your individuality or your agency as a subjective person. It's objectifying in the sense of the way that uh, sort of seeing the self as a set of behaviors or characteristics uh, rather than a subjective entity with um, a unique uh, point of view on on reality. Uh, so like you put the sun in Leo, like, well, reality is what I say it is because I'm the fucking king. Like I, I, I see it, therefore it is. Uh, I am, therefore... <sighs> I, I am, you know, the, the, there's no justification required. I'm here and I see, and my existence uh, is its own validation. And people should just kind of acknowledge that and um, follow it because why wouldn't they? <laughs> I'm the center of the universe, right? As we are all the center of our own little universes. Um, Sun and Aquarius is like, mm, true, true, I am a point of consciousness um, among many points of consciousness. All of which are potentially valid, potentially, you know, not, not necessarily, in many cases, not, you know. <laughs> uh, Aquarius being ruled by Saturn wants to invalidate um, as much as validate, uh, more so, usually. Uh, it's looking for what's wrong, what is not going to work. So while Saturn doesn't necessarily uh, put their stamp of approval on things uh, all the time, it, it's as much about what Saturn doesn't put their stamp of disapproval on that sort of allows things to pass that that filter. So if you know any Sun and Aquarius people, you know, uh, very intelligent, very insightful on human patterns in nature, uh, patterns and their characteristics, and uh, even of their own patterns, um, often also very critical of them and definitely focused on uh, how those things could be improved or how they should be in contrast to how they are, which sucks. How they, how they, how it is now sucks. That's that's basically Aquarius' uh, worldview <laughs> in a lot of cases. No offense, Aquarius people. I love Aquarius. Uh, then we get our, our third point um, of individuation, if you will, which would be Uranus. Uh, in modern astrology, it, Uranus is said to rule Aquarius. I don't uh, personally ascribe to that way of looking at it. Well, there are definitely some profound correspondences between Uranus and Aquarius. Uh, it is Saturn's domain. Aquarius may may like it there and may have a lot of toys to play with. Uh, however, Uranus is sort of a free agent. It's, it's not necessarily responsible for our uh, material affairs. It's not taking responsibility for things. It's it's quite the opposite uh, often. Now, often I think of Uranus, wherever it is, is sort of mm, in an ongoing process of fomenting revolution. 
whether within um, one's own psyche or life, uh, as well as in the world at large. So in Taurus, uh, Uranus is sort of fomenting revolution around, you know, how we experience, cultivate, maintain, and produce the material constructs that support life, uh, that make it enjoyable and pleasant. It's not maybe the, the Capricorn version of Earth where, you know, we're just trying to make sure that ensure that survival continues, uh, which means, you know, pouring gruel and, and seaweed paste down your throat to ensure that you get maximal uh, and, uh, the necessary caloric intake uh, for the day. Uh, Taurus is like, well, how can we make that that seaweed paste tasty? You know, how can we make it enjoyable? And how can we sort of set up a system that is going to maintain our steady supply of not just seaweed paste, but delicious uh, fruit-flavored seaweed paste or uh, insert tasty version here not to uh, overly overdo the 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 food analogies the Taurus because it is overdone but they're useful uh, you'll often see planets in Taurus uh, very interested in beauty as well um, beauty and art and uh, perceiving the world through an aesthetic lens so Uranus could be sort of trying to foment some uh, radical revolutionary um, approaches to individuating oneself um, based on a sort of interesting or unique personal style or, or sort of aesthetic presentation. And um, it's perhaps worth noting, too, that while we do have a square with Uranus and the moon in Leo, they are two points of the zodiac, which um, are very close to being equally distant from the cusp of Cancer as well as Capricorn, which if you recall from previous episodes, uh, discussed as representing uh, a type of aspect or relationship known as Antitia. And so Antitia, uh, not to go over the whole thing again, but if planets uh, or points are, are equally distant from the cusps of Cancer and Capricorn, they have something in common and they have a sort of uh, sympathy and mirroring of each other. And they're said to be equal in power. <clears throat> So in many ways, you can kind of see how that might translate between uh, Leo stuff and Taurus stuff having a bit more in common, where like Leo's like, oh, I uh, want to be the center of the universe and everyone look at me and look to me, you know, for for leadership uh, or for guidance, for for insert here. I want to be the king. Uh, and Taurus is like, yeah, that's cool. Um, I bet you I can think of some ways to make you pop out a little bit more. Um, make you uh, stand out. Uh, it can make you beautiful and give you some nice clothes, nice tailored suit to wear that will sort of uh, raise your your regal pomp up to new levels. While in contrast, uh, the sun and Uranus are in a square as well, um, but they are much closer to being in a contra-antitial point where you still get the sort of equal power uh, one doesn't necessarily get to dominate the relationship. However, they're doing much more different things. They have much different uh, approaches. And you can see how there's maybe not a lot of uh, room in Aquarius for um, making things particularly beautiful. It's not really um, the, the way that Uranus, sorry, that Aquarius planets want to stand out or, or be individuated. I mean, they might want to be... They might want to look pretty while they're standing in the, the corner looking gloomy and standoffish, but it's not really the main uh, emphasis here. But also, um, you know, factor all those elements in. Uh, however, Uranus and Taurus, I also see as uh, <clears throat> really trying to reinvent and revolutionize um, uh, the rhythm at which we engage with life. Uh, Taurus is... Uh, quite focused on and in many cases good at uh, identifying a sort of process and flow to uh, how one engages with uh, the world. You know, say you are, to use a farm analogy, uh, uh, if you live on a farm, work on a farm, there is a very distinct rhythm and pattern to that, that lifestyle. And you're probably going to be a really good farmer if you acclimate to that that rhythm 
uh, it's not just a daily rhythm, it's also a seasonal rhythm. You know, there are times of the year where you plant and times of the year where you sow your crops and uh, part of the year where you just historically uh, hang out and drink beer uh, all winter and <laughs> wait until, until it's time to do farm stuff again. But there's sort of um, getting into the rhythm and flow of life that Taurus sort of specializes at uh, in. And uh, Uranus wants to shake that shit up in many ways, maybe not supporting um, a lot of our natural rhythms and patterns, uh, which could be positive if uh, those rhythms and patterns have not been working particularly well. But uh, just sort of creating a sense of uh, restlessness or boredom, um, I would imagine, for a lot of people. Where I don't want to milk the cows, you know, at 3.30 every day. That's boring. Uh, I want to do something different. I want to invent a, a new way of milking cows. And so that approach may be relevant to uh, our considerations for how we want to maybe uh, establish uh, maybe like a foothold in the sort of new world that we're trying to uh, envision for ourselves. Um, you know, that sort of uh, meeting obligations, uh, acquiescing to those things that we can cannot change while perhaps setting into motion uh, processes which will uh, in the future lead to uh, maybe the fulfilling of those obligations so that we can um, uh, become more sovereign in our life uh, experience. You know, on the ground, it looks like doing just different stuff every day, uh, just doing uh, sometimes the same stuff, not always the most exciting stuff, uh, but it's just a different um, structure to your day. Uh, if you want to build a different life, you have to do different things. And it will tend to be a lot easier if you can find a sort of harmony with that new rhythm. And once you get uh, tuned to to the rhythm of how things are, you know, you can um, you can improvise, you can improv, you can do jazz, you know, you can uh, uh, find ways of um, being creative uh, within the context of a situation of, say, whatever, you know, the bassist and the drummer are, are playing, um, you know, especially if you're like the lead guitarist, you can uh, use that to support you while you, uh, you know, spit out uh, like killer fucking licks uh, on your your guitar and do uh, crotch thrusts on, on stage, you know, like you can, you can um, stand out, but you have to work within the, um, the structure of the, of the band, you know, you have to, to harmonize because if you don't, um, not only is your band going to be pissed off at you, but the audience is probably going to be really annoyed too because it's just not going to sound good. So I think, uh, you know, what this week is sort of calling for is very much a, a tuning into the current rhythm uh, of your life in a sense and maybe slowly, carefully, slowly and carefully introducing uh, a new dynamic or paradigm as opposed to radically... Um, asserting one. However, another theme that sort of comes out of this is, is that uh, you may have to make an assessment of the band you're playing with, in a sense, and um, it may be necessary to, to consider whether or not uh, the differences maybe between band members are, are so uh, so egregious that you're just not able to make the music that you, you know, want to make with them, in which case you may have to uh, kind of leave the band to some degree. Which, you know, will likely precede a period of, of no music, <laughs> if you will. It's kind of uh, either working with the band you have or, or leaving the band uh, and risking, you know, risking the loss of what, you know, you did make together um, in order to seek out something that is, uh, uh, or bandmates that are more in alignment with your, your artistic vision, uh, if you will. You know, maybe you want to go solo, um, start a new project, but you ha your band has a contract with the record company for two more albums and three tours or something like that. So in that context, you, you know, you have to do sort of some math of like how intolerable is the situation? What are the consequences of breaking the contract? Uh, or what are some ways that I might be able to fulfill this contract um, so that I can move on and maybe make the most of that? situation uh while i'm still in it and i think that's kind of where a lot of us are at for the most part is maybe a little more in that like mm, i still got to fulfill this contract before i can quite move on uh i think saturn here uh in aquarius will be keeping a lot of us on that threshold 
for a bit longer uh, until until Saturn moves on to Pisces in March. But I think using this time to formulate a plan uh, and maybe commit to a longer term plan on how to um, sort of step by step uh, inch your way towards uh, moving into the, the new paradigm, if you will. So I think this uh, lunation emphasizes a need to exercise a fair degree of humility, you know, as the moon is this sort of overflowing, uh, overflowing cup uh, at the full at this point in its phase. It's filled with sun Saturn light. So you think of the uh, the proud lion realizing that it, it's still uh, maybe still a kitten or um, that it has some growing up to do before it's quite ready to, to step into that that role of uh, pack leader or something. I'm actually uh, thinking a lot about the movie Lion King right now, where uh, Simba, uh, you know, grew up knowing he was going to be the prince, right, or going to be the king of the jungle. It's kind of that that little that little Leo Moon there. But then uh, Scar, you know, murders murders his dad Mufasa, and spoiler alert, uh, uh, Simba has to go into exile, quite literally, and sort of grow up and figure out whether or not he wants to live the, the carefree uh kumanatata lifestyle in the in the jungle outside or if he wants to step into you know the responsibility that comes with with kingship so i don't know you know maybe this week think about uh to what degree are you simba <laughs> or which character on the lion king are you right now and you see how that fits into your life because I have probably spent uh, more time on this full moon than I intended to, and we should probably move on to the day by day. So Monday, we have the day of the moon, which makes what the moon is doing especially relevant to the sort of ast- the, the conditions that we'll be experiencing on, on Monday. And what's the moon doing? Well, uh, it finds itself uh, kind of in the middle of this little tryst between Venus and Mars. Uh, in the early part of the in the early part of the day, the moon will be applying to both a square with Venus and a sextile with Jupiter, which is pretty nice. Um, you know, it is still it's going to be co-present with Mars, uh, even when it's making applications to both benefics first. Um, I think even uh, in this early part of the day, uh, Mars is introducing a, a a lot of cayenne pepper to the brew it's going to be you know spicy throughout the day um but i think that the first part of the day uh will feel a lot better um sort of getting spicier and spicier uh in a tasty way until until uh you know mid late afternoon or later morning depending on where you are in the world uh when the moon starts separating from jupiter and applying to mars this is like uh, being at Buffalo, Buffalo Wild Wings, um, where the moon is getting, you know, its favorite uh, hot barbecue sauce that is uh, spicy and flavorful at the same time. However, around afternoon, uh, Buffalo Wild Wings decides that they're not going to make hot barbecue sauce anymore. And you're the moon and you just learned that. But you're at the restaurant. What are you going to order? Well, I want spicy and I want flavor. Maybe I'll try the blazing wings and the blazing wings fry your, you know, the roof of your mouth off. Uh, that's maybe what we're dealing with this week, uh, or the, uh, this Monday, uh, some themes like that. So I'm going to give, uh, Monday, uh, partly cloudy transitioning into thunderstorms during the second half of the day. Then, uh, Tuesday we get, uh, the day of Mars and there's quite a bit going on with Mars on Tuesday. Uh, Sort of a lot of astrological, uh, a lot of attention being directed towards Mars. Uh, it's still going to be hanging out with the moon, um, which from Mars's perspective, uh, is kind of an annoyance. Um, the moon tends to make Mars a little more phlegmy and irritable and grouchy and groggy, uh, a little more sluggish and a little more emotionally reactive. It's something to be watchful for. Uh, however, there is some sort of um, stabilizing support uh, with the loose uh, sextile with Jupiter. And Venus is applying to the square, which we talked about uh, a bit already, which, you know, has a, a mixed bag kind of benefit support to, to Mars. Um, but we're still kind of coming off of a, 
trine with the sun and Mars, uh, which the sun will, you know, tend to give a little more juice to Mars, especially when um, in a more favorable aspect, such as the trine, um, to the degree that that the sun can (laughs) in Aquarius provide an abundance of energy. Uh, That energy is is, going to be a little more not straight solar, it's going to be infused with, with Saturn energy, which can be moderating for Mars. Um, I'd say this could be kind of an irritable, grouchy kind of Tuesday, but maybe a little easier to tap into a more objective viewpoint and uh, sort of do what needs to be done, accomplish the mission, regardless of how we're feeling about it. Um, I am going to call Tuesday partly cloudy and, uh, and windy, we'll say. Mostly cloudy. Maybe just to note, uh, I'm not predicting the actual weather uh, in your in your particular location. Uh, and if it happens to correspond, uh, it's probably uh, just luck. Uh, it's more of a symbolic weather forecast. Then uh, moving into Wednesday, we get the day of Mercury. And Mercury is uh, still in Capricorn, still not out of its shadow quite yet. Uh, not not still retracing degrees that it already covered during its retrograde. However, it is picking up speed. It's moving at a, a solid uh, degree per day pace, which is much more uh, comfortable mercurial pace, and starting to gain ground on the sun. And this is a, a phase of Mercury that is particularly energetic, a little more um, quick on the draw, if you will. It uh, tends to be sharp uh, and curious, and clever uh, and outspoken during this phase. So it's uh, in Capricorn, you can imagine, uh, maybe a high degree of efficiency, sort of a efficient and clear communication, uh, purposeful and goal-oriented. While I, I generally prefer to see Mercury getting a little more as- aspects, uh, being in more aspects with other planets, it seems like favorable for more solitary work like sort of putting your head down and focusing in on a task uh, and maybe uh, issuing uh, communications to others, um, but not like in a chit-chatty way, like a like need-to-know sort of way. I think uh, quite good for problem-solving as well. Mercury's still coming off that trine with Uranus and is generally going to be kind of oriented towards that in Capricorn anyway, so any work like that uh, of a problem-solving sort of nature, you need to untangle or, or deconstruct and sort of work out the kinks um, and anything you have going on, I think Wednesday will be supportive for for those sorts of endeavors. So I'm going to give uh, things. I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a weather person, but I, I'm, what's that like uh, type of weather? I feel like I've had days like this where it's the skies seem kind of clear, but it's not really sunny. You know, it's visibility is good. It's not like dreary per se, but it's not like a bright and illuminating kind of day. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll go with partly cloudy, <laughs> for lack of a, a weather analogy. Uh, partly cloudy and, and maybe low humidity, kind of dry. And then uh, Thursday, we got the day of Jupiter. And uh, Thursday, I actually quite like, uh, particularly around morning time, um, we'll have the moon in Cancer, which will have like a brief kind of square with Jupiter in Aries. Uh, and then sort of move on. But I think Thursday is like a, you know, Thursdays have been pretty okay <laughs> lately. Uh, Jupiter is actually at a pretty strong point in Aries where it has both triplicity and bound rulership over that particular slice of, of the Zodiac in Aries. And it's not getting beat up by other planets. Uh, so there's, you know, a fair amount of uh, Jupiterian hope and optimism it's just uh, going to tend to be more of the uh, the Aries quality, where it's more self uh, focused and driven. You know, it's not uh, necessarily fostering the sort of uh, group unity that Jupiter is typically good for. Um, and I'll take that back. It's group unity, but under a central command. <laughs> you know, uh, it's not. It's more of an authoritarian or uh, top down kind of structure as opposed to the kind of group dynamic that um, where everybody's voice is maybe heard equally. 
So good for personal power and leadership that is both, you know, that is fair, um, but still places, you know, a particular person sort of at the top. It's maybe easy to feel into your own personal, your sense of personal authority on Thursday. So I'm going to, I'm going to give it sunny, just, just sunny. It's good. It's a good day. And then uh, Friday we have the, the day of Venus. <clears throat> and I think we're going to see a lot of uh, what we talked about with Venus square Mars on, on Friday, because uh, uh, Venus is going to be within about a degree of that square all day Friday. And when the sun goes down and we move into the, uh, uh, we move into the night of Mars. Friday night is Mars night, so uh, factor that into your 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 Friday day and evening plans. Um, not saying don't go out and have fun. Uh, just you know, be aware of the particular conditions uh, and the sorts of um, characters that they may tend to uh, evoke uh, out of the world. Uh, these Venus Mars types. Um, uh, and then Saturday we have the day of Saturn. And what's Saturn doing? Well, it is now under the beams of the sun. And while uh, being in its own sign protects it from being burnt up, <clears throat> made into Saturn paste uh, for <laughs> the sun to uh, use and dispose of it as, at, their, uh, at his particular will, uh, it does mean that Saturn is not visible. So the, the Saturnian uh, process uh, is definitely becoming more internal. Um, internally felt and experienced on a collective level, which, you know, none of this will override uh, your chart or your particular way of experiencing Saturn um, on a sort of grand life way, but uh, you can tune into it and feel it. Um, so you may uh, feel a little bit, you know, gloomier or down or hard on yourself on Saturday. But I would say that uh, as we're as it sort of colors the day uh, leading up to the full moon in Leo, a good day to meditate on the Saturnian side uh, the, or the Saturnian approach to not just how you want to do the next couple weeks, but really um, this is sort of the the waning dark moon of the Saturn cycle, the Sun-Saturn cycle. We're closing out a period of, of Saturn, Saturnian works, and we're entering a new one. <clears throat> so how do you want to do, how do you want to Saturn the next a uh, year and m month or so. You know, what structures do you want to uh, untangle, disentangle yourself from, and which ones do you want to implement and build up? I think Saturday's a good day for addressing those uh, personal obligations. Maybe those, maybe the last bits of uh, a personal commitment or meeting a deadline. I think it's best used is by... Um, but, you know, if you've met most of your obligations for the week uh, and don't have any big grand visions for the future, uh, you can probably relax. Just know that, you know, if you have any uh, sort of unmet obligations, uh, <laughs> uh, if you're shirking duties on Saturday, you're, gonna, you're not going to be able to escape uh, <laughs> them, uh, at least not on an internal level. So, you know, I wouldn't um, start binge watching, you know, The Office or something. Uh, on Saturday, if you have like um, a book report and you know two short essays uh, that you have to finish this weekend, uh, I don't think I don't think you're going to get to enjoy uh, <laughs> your office marathon because it's likely to, that those obligations are going to kind of nah nag at you until you you know start working on them, put in a, an appropriate amount of work on them, and then uh, Saturday we get our our full moon Sunday, which seems um, appropriate for the role that the sun needs to take on, I think, uh, for this lunation. Um, the emphasis does sort of land on the moon during a full moon, obviously. Uh, however, the, the, it's the sun's light that the moon is full of. Um, and in this case, the sun's actually ruling, ruling the moon. So I think uh, a good day for sort of uh, donning the sun and Aquarius um, visage of maybe exiled king or uh, wizened and detached philosopher king. Like, uh, this is maybe a good day to meditate on the, uh, the limits of your personal power, how to operate within the, the constraints and limit, uh, within the confines of them, of those, of the, 
within those limitations <clears throat> you sort of come to terms or kind of peace with with those um but also or to uh sort of take a look at the the little uh baby lion <laughs> that lives within all of us and uh maybe find a way to to lecture that baby lion on on the principles of of uh limit <laughs> of limits and power uh, of limits and responsibility um but maybe doing so in a, a gentle not overly harsh way if you can help it i wonder if some of those who of us yeah, those of us who are parents might find themselves in, in scenarios where they might be having to set uh firm boundaries or deliver some bitter uh tidbits of saturnian wisdom to their their lion cubs but um yeah i think with that i'm gonna wrap it up for this week trying to find a way to to not to not make these last quite so long uh it's longer than i anticipated but i do hope that everyone finds it helpful helps uh helps you engage with your your week in a more productive way or at least taught you a, a thing or two about you know what uh these particular planetary combinations mean um in fact it's probably one of my personal uh preferred ways to utilize transits uh so I don't always see them showing up substantially uh, for me in my personal life. In fact, most of the time I don't because, uh, you know, not all the transits are, are for each and every one of us. <laughs> they uh, will tend to show up more if uh, they're hitting your chart in a particular way. But I like to use them as just sort of opportunities to tune in to those archetypes and um, sort of observe and allow uh, allow them to offer me little tidbits on uh, what they mean so I can understand them better. You know, what they mean uh, in a mundane sense, transit-wise, but also what they might mean for somebody who uh, has those placements in their birth chart. But, uh, yeah, well, I think with that, I'm going to wrap it up. As always, you can book a reading with me at kylepierceastrologer.com. And, uh, yeah, I just want to thank everyone for, for listening um, as well as watching. Uh, I've been doing uh, the podcast for almost two years now, but uh, only maybe just recently started seriously trying to do uh, YouTube video versions of these, and um, been wonderful, wonderful to get you know so much cheese. Uh, wonderful to get so much positive feedback from people. Uh, it's exciting to reach uh, 1,000 views for the first time uh, for last week's forecast. So just thank you all for watching and. Uh, for subscribing and liking and all that. <laughs> so I look forward to seeing how this maybe a uh, new approach to, to doing these, um, to doing the podcast might evolve in the future, um, as well as doing maybe other things that aren't necessarily directly tied to the, the podcast. Anywho, um, yeah, have a great week and we'll see you next time. And if you have a question you'd like to hear answered on Astrology Hotline, shoot us an email at astrologyhotlinepod at gmail.com. Mm -hmm.